As I was preparing uh, this message to close out our, our sermon series today, we're, we're, we're finishing our series, Abraham, A Journey in Faith. I, I began thinking, I'm, we're talking about Abraham, this great man of faith. I began to think of all the, the men and women of faith that God has placed in my life. And, and I tell you, as I began thinking about each one, the, the list kind of started getting long, and, and I, was, I was really feeling blessed uh, by all the people God has put in my life. So I, I mean, I actually thought of several preachers and, and, and several professors and elders and deacons. I thought of many men and women who have faithfully taught and loved at every opportunity, served at every opportunity. But one man's faith and one man's story has always struck me. It's always amazed me since the very day I heard it, even before I was a Christian or, or, or a devout father at the time anyways. Uh, I remember hearing this man's story and thinking, my goodness, what a story. His name was Tom. Tom lived in my hometown, and, and for uh, when I first met Tom, Tom was in his late 60s, I imagine, and uh, Tom would, have, would tell you, and he told many people that for many years he, he struggled uh, with sin in his life, and, and, and until one day he woke up in the morning and he looked himself in the mirror, and uh, God had been working on him to, to, to give his life to God for a long time. And, and Tom finally woke up this morning, he looked in the mirror, and he, he said, you know, I felt like God said to me, Tom, if you walk away this day, if you don't accept me today, then I'm done with you. Like I'm, this is your last chance. And so Tom was struck by that, and Tom said, you know what, I've got to, I've got to repent. And so immediately that day, Tom repented. Tom gave his life to the Lord, and he began to live for Him in every way he knew, he knew how. For several years, or for a few years anyways, Tom remained as a layman in the church. I mean, he served and, and did all these things, but he kind of just came to church uh, every week and, and uh, multiple times a week. But it didn't take long before Tom realized, you know, something else, is, it, it, God has something else in mind for me. He started feeling this call from God to preach. On one particular night, it all came to a head. Tom and his family were out in the town, and, uh, and uh, Tom felt this urge from deep within, and, 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 and it was stronger than it ever had been. And Tom began realizing, you know, I've got to address this, this step. I've got to address this issue this very day. I can't put this off any longer. And so he took his family back home. He dropped them off. He told his wife and kids, he said, hey, I've got to run to the church. I've got something I've got to pray about. And so they went inside. He ran off to church and he got to church and he darted. They had a little prayer room. He darted for the prayer room. He hit his knees and he began praying to God. And what he began doing is offering up every excuse Tom ever had as to why he could not preach. You ever make an excuse? <laughs> God, this is why I can't do that. I'll assure you that, that, that it, it, he probably responded in, in much the same way as many preachers have responded. Uh, I'll assure you of this, that when God was calling me to preach, I gave every reason in the world I could think of as to why I shouldn't answer the calling at that moment. So Tom come in that night and he began praying, God, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. But Tom had an excuse that, that, that completely squashes out any excuse I could ever imagine. In fact, Tom had a reason as to why he couldn't preach that was actually a huge obstacle in his way for a man who's going to preach the Word of God. And that obstacle is that Tom could not read. As a young boy, Tom had, uh, he had to quit school at a very early age because uh, his family needed, needed work. So Tom quit school and he had to go to work for his family. And uh, so Tom never went through school. And so at an, at, even as an adult now, Tom could not read. And if you're called to, to open up Scripture and, and expound on what God is saying, if you're called to, I mean, what's, the, what's one of the things I do every single Sunday when I stand up here? I open up the Scripture and I say, you know, blah, blah, blah. I read through the passage. I mean, you're going to be a preacher, but you can't read the Word of God. He starts saying, God, there is no possible way I can preach and teach your Word because I can't even read it. Talk about a, a good excuse, right? Good reason. Not being able to read is quite a problem when you're going to preach and teach the Word of God. So Tom began wrestling with God. I can't do this. I can't read. God, how am I supposed to preach Your Word if I can't even read Your Word? It's a legitimate question to ask. 
And after a while of praying, after a while of wrestling with God and this calling, Tom said he, he felt like God gave him an answer to his biggest obstacle. He said, God told me if you answer my calling to preach, I'll take care of that. If you answer my calling to preach, Tom, don't worry about the fact you can't read. If you answer my calling to preach, I'll take care of that problem. It was one of those, if you do this and I'll do that type situation. You answer, I'll take care of that. You know, sometimes God calls us to take certain steps in our lives, and if we're quite honest, we can't imagine how it's all going to work out. We don't understand it. We can't fathom it. We, we don't feel equipped to, or even capable in the slightest. So it doesn't make sense to us, and it doesn't make sense to the people around us. We go talk to them, and we're like, well, I know you can't do that, right? You don't have the resources. You don't have the strength. You don't have the ability. So because it seems so impossible, so impractical, because all of our ducks aren't in the row, like we've got to have every single one of them from mama back to the littlest one in the back because they're not all in a row, we say, you know what, can't cross the road, can't go across the pond, can't take a step. We wonder, you know, is all of this going to, if we do take a step, is all of this going to come together in the end, we just can't see it. But isn't that where faith comes in? A lot of times we put too much faith in self and not enough faith in God. And so because we can't get all the ducks in a row, we say, I don't know if it's going to work out. But isn't that, you know, the ducks are kind of running around. Isn't that when we put our faith in God? You remember what Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, we mentioned this in the first sermon of the series. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is saying, I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how it's, it's, it's going to, to go. I don't know what the end result is being. But I feel like God has called me into this place. And so faith says, I don't see it. It's a, thing, it's a, it's a conviction of things uh, not seen. It's an assurance of things not hoped for. We don't see the end product. We can't even see the middle ground. We only know the next step. And if we take that step, like Tom answering the call to preach, we take it by... Faith. We don't know the end result, but we know the next step, and that's enough. And that's what we see with, with Abraham today as we close out this series. Abraham doesn't know the end result, he doesn't know the middle ground, but he knows the next step. So Abraham takes a step by faith. It's found in Genesis, I told you, it's found in Genesis chapter 22. And we begin in verses 1 and 2. You read along with me. It says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to, Ab and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here I am. And God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now it begins here, this whole story, it's interesting that the narrator, Moses, as he wrote this book, he felt it necessary to begin this entire story by saying what? After these things, God tested Abraham. I mean, he, he felt necessary, I've got to point out, this whole thing is a test. We read the things that follow, it's quite drastic, isn't it? I mean, it's unimaginable type stuff right here. Like, this is, this is some pretty, it's pretty, I mean... If you're reading this for the first time and you don't understand this is a test, you're going to take walk away with some kind of incorrect view of God. So the narrator here, he feels it necessary to point out that, that all of this was a test. Did Abraham know that? <laughs> Abraham has no idea. Like we have that, that luxury to see this is a test before we keep on going. Abraham has no idea. He just, God just comes in and says, hey, Abraham. He says, yeah, what's up? I'm here. And so God says, this is what I want you to do. Here is the command. And it's an extreme command, isn't it? Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Sacrifice him. Give him up as a burnt offering. 
I mean, you want to talk about a step of faith, folks. Take your only son, offer him up as a sacrifice. Abraham has no idea. Again, Abraham has no idea this is a test. So far as he can understand it here, God is, is telling him, go sacrifice your son. And he has had no clue that God is saying, oh, this is a test. God doesn't come in and say, you know what, Abraham, chill out. But this is what I'm going to tell you to do. Go up here, act like you're going to offer your son. Go ahead for it, you know. And, and then once you get there, I'm going to tell you to stop because I'm not actually going to have you do it. I just want to see if you're willing to do it. God doesn't come in and say, listen, it's not, I'm not going to stop you. He says, this is what you got to do. And we have the luxury we could see it and say you know what it's a test we don't have to we don't like freak out about it even when, I, when we start reading it we, we know what's about to happen but Abraham has zero clue Abraham fully expects that God wants him to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering so put yourself in his sandals for a moment consider what God is asking you're Abraham. Isaac is your son. And by this point, he is your only son. Now, I know we covered chapter 16 where he had another son named Ishmael. Remember that, Ishmael and Hagar? By this point, though, in Genesis 22, Ish, uh, uh, Sarah and Isaac, have, you, know, had, you remember they had the run-ins at the beginning, but, uh, but they had the run-ins again with Hagar and Ishmael. And so uh, Sarah's like, she's got to get out of here. Can't be dealing with her anymore. And so she, she says, you know, we've got to send you away. And so God, Abraham comes to God, and God's like, yeah, send her away. I'm going to establish her through Isaac. He is your son. So at this moment, the only son living in, in Abraham's house is Isaac. So far as, as, as he understands, this is his only son. Son, it's the only child he has left. And if you remember, it took a while to receive him, didn't it? I mean, if you're Abraham, you waited 100 years just to meet him. Years of infertility left you with no hope in ever having children. Then God gives you a promise, hey, you're going to have a son. You wait 25 long and painful years before that child is born. And God tells you that through this child, you're going to have descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth and as numerous as the stars in the sky. You know that through this son Isaac, and this is a big deal in the, in the Hebrew culture, you're going to have descendants like crazy. So like you're going to have descendants forever. And, and Abraham's thinking, man, this is a blessing. Thank you, God, for this promise. You're going to extend my descendants all the way through Isaac. Isaac is a picture of hope fulfilled. Isaac is the boy of promise. He's your boy. Your flesh and blood. And you absolutely love him. You'd do anything for him. You'd kill or be killed for this boy. Now God says, take him. Take your son. Your only son. Ishmael's gone, Abraham. Take your only son. The boy you love. And offer him as a burnt offering for me. This far surpasses leaving your home, right? As we saw at the beginning of the study. I mean, God is asking Abraham to take a major step of faith. This isn't some small act of obedience. This is like the pinnacle of human obedience. To follow through would be the Mount Everest, uh, Mount Everest of obedient faith. Now the truth is, today, God's never going to ask us to do this. He's not going to ask you to take your child and sacrifice your child uh, on a burnt offering. I heard a joke. It's probably a bad one. But, but David Stone over... It's always good to lead off a joke with that, isn't it? Uh, David Stone pre up at, at South... Not South... On Southeast Christian Church uh, once did a sermon on this, on this, uh, this passage. And after he preached the sermon, a, a parent texted him and said... Well, he was talking about how old Isaac would have been. And they said, you know, Isaac had to be a young boy at this point because if he's a teenager, it wouldn't be a sacrifice anymore. Uh... <laughs> I, told, I told you it was a bad joke before I started but uh, <laughs> I 
They didn't have anything to do with the next thing I'm going to say. But <laughs> this is a great step of faith. And the truth is, God isn't going to ask any of us to do that, that type of faith, to take that type of step. I mean, this is a one-time test, and this one-time test really points to what God's going to do in the New Testament, right? I mean, take your one and only son, take your only son, well, that, that, that obviously has some connotations of the New Testament, that, that God's going to sacrifice His only son. He's going to call Abraham to, to do, He's going to stop Abraham short of doing something that only God would do Himself. And just a small fun fact, the sacrifice of Christ is quite believed to have happened on the same mountain in Moriah that Abraham began to offer up Isaac. So God's probably not going to, He's not going to ask you to do this. But as I spoke about in the first sermon of this series, God's likely going to ask you to do something, isn't He? I mean, God's never said, hey, become a Christian and just sit there. You know the Great Commission? <laughs> we have a job to do. So God's not going to say, just sit there, become a Christian, get your ticket into heaven, relax. I mean, God's going to call us to do something, take some step of faith for Him. Maybe like Abraham, it involves a sacrifice, whether that's of your time or your energy or your, or your finances. Maybe, God, as we spoke about again in the first week, maybe it's to downsize, to tithe, or to give above your tithe. Maybe it's that you need to forgive someone and let go of some bitterness. Maybe it's that you need to reconcile with someone, to begin a relationship with someone at work or in your neighborhood that everyone else doesn't want to be around. You know, that hard person at work or that hard person in your neighborhood that like, like they don't want to talk to you or they're just kind of rude every time you talk to them. Maybe God's saying you need to love that person. Maybe you need to end a relationship that's taking you away from God. Maybe you need to trust that God will take care of you even if you live obediently for Him at work or at school. Maybe God is asking you to serve in your community or serve at your church to share the gospel message with a family member, a co-worker, a boss, a friend, a teacher. God might ask you to do something, to stop doing something, to give something, to say something, to sell something, to start something, to end something, or to love someone. Whatever it is, God's asking you to do something. What are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Abraham has received the command, he's received the call from God. You have one son, your only son, whom you love. Take him to Moriah on the mountain I'm going to show you. Sacrifice your son as a burnt offering there for me. What does Abraham do? Look ahead at verse 3. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning. I imagine that that night it's going to be hard for Abraham to sleep, wouldn't you think? So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey, took two of, of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Basically, in a nutshell, Abraham gets to it. Wastes no time. He, he sleeps a little bit, although, again, it's probably not very good sleep. And in all reality, wastes no time. God gives him the command, sacrifice your son. The very next morning, Abraham begins making preparations. I want you to notice this morning what is missing from the text. God says, go sacrifice your son, and Abraham doesn't ask any questions at all. Let's be honest, how many of us are going to have some questions? I mean, we're going to be flipping out, aren't we? I mean, if you, God come to you and said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, man, we're going to be like, are you saying, that can't be you. Like, like, what are you saying to me right now? I, I'll be honest with you, I, I began thinking of all the things I would be asking. I'll give you a list of them right now, maybe you would be the same. But God said, go sacrifice your son. I'm going to be asking God, how could I? I love this child. He's my only son. What about that promise you gave me? What about the descendants? What about the hope that you gave me through him? And what on earth am I ever going to tell Sarah? Yeah, some of you women, yeah. Yeah, I'll sock you in the head if you ever think about doing something like that. 
What am I going to tell Sarah? How on earth can I explain this to my wife? God, you saw her face when Isaac was born. She was a picture of joy. How can I take that away from her? Are you sure that's what you want me to do? I mean, we're going to have a ton of questions. We have tons of questions for things that are a lot less significant than sacrificing your son. But Abraham has none. Abraham doesn't ask God why or how or what will happen. He doesn't ask for a sign or offer up his concern. And so far as we know, Abraham doesn't even consult his closest companion about it. He doesn't go to Sarah and say, hey, this is what God's asked me to do. What do you think about it? Like You can imagine what that conversation is going to be like, can't you? He doesn't go to a servant who he knows fears the Lord. He doesn't... I mean, if there's a preacher out in the, or, or, or somebody out in, in, in his area, he doesn't go to them and be like, this is what he's saying. Like, I don't know about this. Abraham offers no questions, offers no concerns, talks to nobody about it. He just gets right to it. He gets up the next morning, grabs two of his servants, grabs Isaac. He prepares everything he's going to need for this offering right there where he's at. Just in case, you know, if I get there, I don't have everything I need. I'm going to make sure I have it before I get there. And he sets off for the journey. With one of the toughest commands ever given to man, Abraham responds. Abraham walks in obedience. It's almost mind-boggling how quickly and how readily he was able to do this, isn't it? I mean, this type of obedience is almost unheard of. And I'll be honest with you, as I read this story, I wonder what was going through Abraham's mind that he would respond so quickly to such a command. But then I look closer at the text. And within these verses, we find the answer to that question. We find it actually in verses 7 and 8. They begin the journey. It's about a three-day journey. And once they, they take off, Abraham gets up here, and, and, and on the third day, he looks up, and he sees the mountain on which God is telling him to go. And so he stops right here, and he says, Hey, uh, servants, y'all stay here with the donkey. Me and the boy, we're going to go up here to, uh, to the mountain. And then we read this in verse 7 and 8. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, Abraham said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they, both went, so, so they went, both of them together. We mentioned the age of Isaac. By, by, by most people's estimations, Isaac is probably in his teenage years. Some imagine that he might be in his early 20s. I've seen as upward as, as 30s. Most people settle within teenage or early 20s. But Isaac looks around at everything that's going, that, that he knows they're going up here to make a burnt offering. He sees everything that, that, that they need for that. And he realizes that, that, that they have, well, he realizes they have everything except for one crucial part for a burnt offering, and that is the sacrifice. So Isaac asks his dad, Hey, Papa, where's the lamb? And in Abraham's response, we find a glimpse of what Abraham is thinking, don't we? What, what, what does he say? God will provide. God will provide for Himself the lamb. He will provide for Himself the sacrifice. God will provide. It's an interesting response. If Isaac is supposed to be the sacrifice, as God has commanded then isn't the sacrifice already there? I mean, if we think about it, the sacrifice is walking right there. Where's the lamb? Where you, honestly, Isaac, you're the lamb, right? I mean, Isaac is the one walking right there with Abraham in Abraham's mind. He's the one carrying the wood for the sacrifice. So it's an interesting response because Abraham says God will provide. But it points to Abraham's great faith. You see, Abraham knows the promise of God. 
Abraham, as we've mentioned throughout this series, knows that God has promised that through Isaac, he is going to establish Abraham's descendants, and they're going to be like the dust of the earth, and they're going to be like the stars in the sky forever. So in Abraham's mind, somehow, Isaac will walk away from this day. In fact, if you go back to verse 5, we didn't read verse 5, we're going to read it now. If you go back to verse 5, we see this idea. It says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham doesn't say, I alone will come back to you. He says, I and the boy are going to go over here. We're going to worship and we're going to come back to you. Abraham believes that both Isaac and himself are going to return. The author of Hebrews adds to Abraham's thought process this way surrounding this event. Hebrews 11, verses 17 and 19, specifically verse 19, says, By faith, Abraham did all of this because he considered that God was able to even, raise, or able even to raise him from the dead. You want to talk about some faith? Up to this point in, in, in Genesis, we have read nothing of a resurrection from the dead. I mean, that is unheard of. Someone dies, they go to the ground, they're, they're done forever. And Abraham says, you know what? I don't know how it's going to work. But somehow, Isaac will walk away. Abraham says, you know, God has promised that through Isaac, he's going, to, he's going to create all of these descendants, and he has now commanded that, that, that I do this. So if it requires God to do something that's never happened, if it requires God to do the impossible, to raise Isaac from the dead, God will fulfill his promise. Abraham's act of obedience was filled with amazing faith. And God. So when Isaac asks, where's the lamb? Abraham doesn't understand it. He, can't, uh, he, he never received an explanation of how it's going to happen. And he certainly can't even begin to try to explain what will happen. He just knew that God would provide. And within Abraham's faith, we find a principle that remains to this day with us as well. That God provides when we act in faith. That when we respond in obedience to what God has asked us to do commanded us to do. God will provide. And even though this is a Mount Everest type climb of obedience, and even though Abraham can't grasp his mind around it, he knows that if he steps out in faith, God will provide. Because God's asking you to do something for Him. So God will provide a lamb for Himself. Let me tell you, when you step out in faith, whether it's with your finances, a relationship, a conversation, a service opportunity, a job change, a boldness of faith, or whatever it might be, if it's in the will of God, then know that God will provide. Be sure of it. Abraham certainly was. But of course, if I had to imagine being human, we're going to ask the question, aren't we? How can I be so sure? When I preach sermons like these, I often think to kind of the carnal side of myself. And even as I'm writing this down, I'm thinking, well, God, how can I make sure that everyone's sure that this will happen? How can I be sure, God? You call me to step out. How am I going to be sure? that you're going to provide? How am I going to be sure that you show up? Part of that faith problem, isn't it? Think about, think about Abraham for just a moment. How can Abraham be so sure? And let's talk about Abraham. Consider again what's going on here. If Abraham goes through with this, Abraham again not knowing the end of the story, Abraham not having a clue that it's a, that it's a, that it's a test, Think about what's at stake here. If God doesn't provide, what happens? Let's be honest. If God doesn't provide the lamb before Abraham sacrifices his son, what happens? Isaac is dead. 
Like if God doesn't provide, how uh, what's going to happen? Isaac is dead. He doesn't just Abraham doesn't just lose some money or lose some energy or lose some of his time or or, or possessions or whatever it might be. Abraham loses his son. And how do you explain that to your wife when you come home? Like I thought God was telling me to sacrifice my son. Apparently it wasn't so. I'm sorry. Like how are you going to go through that conversation? When risking everything, how can Abraham, how can we be so sure that God will provide? Because it's scary when you're walking up the mountain in Moriah. Your faith isn't strong. Think about Abraham's story. We've been walking now, I think it's been about eight weeks we've been walking here with Abraham. Think about Abraham's story. This Moriah incident, it isn't the first time he stepped out in faith, is it? I mean, Abraham has a story that's continually stepping out in faith, stepping out in faith, stepping out in faith, again and again. And every time Abraham stepped out in faith, he noticed a pattern. God provided. Think back to the stories we've covered. Chapter 12, Abraham's called to leave his family and his country, all of his sense of security, everyone he's ever loved, and go where God would show him. Abraham obeys and God provides. Chapter 13, Abraham gives Lot the choice of land. Choose whatever land you want, Lot, and I'll take what's left over because he believed God would take care of him. Lot takes the best land in the area, the most fertile soil. Abraham receives what is left over, what nobody wants. But what did Abraham hurt when that happened? Not at all. God provided. Chapter 14, Abraham rescues a captured Lot from the middle of war. He didn't have as many soldiers as the other people had, but he went off anyways, and God provided. Chapter 15 through 17, Abraham receives the promise of a son named Isaac. And when Abraham was, 50, was 100 years old, despite all odds, way beyond the childbearing years, he receives a, ch- a child God provided. Genesis 18, Abraham prays by faith that God would spare the righteous. And even though Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed, Lot and his family are rescued. God provided. Time and time again, Abraham stepped out in faith. He didn't know what was going to happen when he took a step out. He had no clue what would happen at that moment. But Abraham stepped out anyways. And time and time again, as Abraham stepped out in faith, God provided Abraham was so certain that God would provide because he had stepped out in faith before and he had seen God's provision. So with that in mind, I want to tell you two things are true this morning. Number one, if you have never stepped out in faith in your life, you'll never know that God will provide when you act in faith. If you don't take a step of faith, you'll never know this principle to be true. Some people can't, can't be certain that God will provide because they've never acted in faith. They, they got their ticket and said, I'm going to sit in church on a Sunday, maybe on a Wednesday, and we have a special event, I might show up if I don't have anything else going on. And so they never step out. They never see God provide in ways unimaginable. They never see like, like what great faith can accomplish in action. If we never step out in faith, we'll never know the provision of God. So... so, so I mean, they've never crossed, or they've never built an ark with Noah. They've never crossed the Red Sea with Moses. They never marched around the walls of Jericho with Joshua. They never stood in the face of Goliath with David. They never spoken up in the face of opposition with the prophets. They never left everything they knew, their jobs or whatever it might be, to walk with Jesus with the apostles. They never stepped out of the boat in the middle of a storm with Peter or climbed a mountain in Moriah with Abraham. Folks, if we never step out in faith, we'll never see that God provides for us. We'll continue living on our own power and we'll accomplish very little at the end of our life in regards to what God needs us to do, or requires of us to do. So if we want to know if God's going to provide, step out in faith. Try it. See if He'll provide for you. Walk in His will. And number two, if you've stepped out in faith in the will of God, then you can look back at how God's provided for your acts of faith before. You'll see where He has fulfilled promises. You've experienced it, so you can trust that He will do it again. Abraham expects God to provide because Abraham has seen it before. He's seen promise after promise be fulfilled. He doesn't know how God will provide. He doesn't know when God will provide. But he knows, beyond a shadow of a doubt, God will provide. So Abraham says, Isaac, we're going up this mountain. God will provide a lamb for himself. And Abraham 
obeys. And in the verses that follow, we see just that. Imagine this scene for a moment. It, it, picture what has taken place. I think we know this scene so well. We've heard this story so many times that we look at it and, and, and it kind of loses its dramatic effect, doesn't it? Imagine the tension. Imagine the awkwardness here. Abraham and Isaac reach the top of the mountain where God told them to go. Abraham builds the altar as he has always done to offer up this burnt offering. He has the wood in place. He has the fire ready for its proper time. And he binds Isaac just as he would any sacrificial lamb. Again, think about the awkwardness here. Where's the lamb, Daddy? God will provide. And now Abraham is, is tying up his son. With, T with Isaac bound at this moment, I'm sure tears are flowing as Abraham places his son on the wood. Even if he believes God's going to provide him, I mean, think about what he's doing to his son. Tears had him. This is an emotional experience. And Abraham grabs his knife and he raises it up in the air just as he would any other time. And Abraham has every single intention to bring this knife down upon his son just as he has every lamb he has ever sacrificed for God. Tears flowing, knife in the air. Abraham begins going down, never expecting God to intervene, never thinking anything other than, I'm going to kill my son this very day. I'm going to sacrifice my son this very day. And as he brings the knife down at the last possible moment, I believe, God speaks up. Abraham, Abraham. Don't lay your, your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For, I, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And I'm sure as Abraham hears these words and he sees what he's about did to his child, I mean, tears are flowing. This time it's not tears of like, what, have I just, what, have, what, have, what am I going to do? But it's like tears of joy because he looks up and he sees there what he hadn't seen before. That there's a ram caught over here in the thickets. God provided in Abraham's act of faith. As Abraham walked obediently for God, God provided for Abraham's act of faith, and He'll do it in our lives too. Now I understand the timing might not be what we want or expect. I'm sure that, that, that Abraham would have wanted God to provide that ram at any point earlier than what he did. Like provided before the altar is made, or provided before he, he bound his son as a sacrifice, definitely provided before he's raised his knife to slaughter his own son. But at the perfect moment, God provided. And if you ever stepped out in faith according to God's will, I believe He'll provide for you as well. But do you believe it enough to step out in faith? Do you believe that He'll provide enough that you're willing to step out in faith? That night, Tom finished his prayer. Again, he'd offered up every excuse to God, including the fact that he could not read. He finished his prayer after receiving the answer that, that he received. And despite not being able to read, he believed if I answered this calling to preach, God would provide. And believing that, he stood up and he went back to his car and he went on home and he told his wife, I, I, I'm answering the call to preach. God has called me to preach. I'm going to answer it. And, and that very next Sunday, he stood up in front of the entire church and he said, God has called me into ministry. God has called me to preach. And even that Sunday, Tom could not read. But he believed. He had faith. Not long after he, he announced that he, had, that he had accepted the calling to preach and, and, and to, to walk in God's will, Tom's sister-in-law came by his house with a collection of cassette tapes which uh, had the Bible recorded on them. 
And so she said, here you go, Tom, I want to offer this as a gift to you. And so Tom uh, started thinking, you know, I'll start reading along, I guess. And here's what amazes me. Tom would sit by the radio and his wife would, would put in the cassette tape on, on whatever chapter, book and chapter it's supposed to be on. And she would take the Bible and she'd turn it over to what it is. So if it's like John chapter 1, he, she would put the cassette tape in there. She would turn his Bible over to John chapter 1 say it's beginning right here. They, the, the man over, I presume it's a man, over, the, uh, the, radio, or over the, the cassette tape would begin reading the passage and Tom, as best he could, would follow along. And here's what amazes me. After a little while of this, Tom was able to read. But it's not just that Tom was able to read. Tom was able to read the Bible. Let me take it a step further for you. The amazing thing is also, though, is that Tom was only able to read the Bible. If you handed Tom a newspaper, he couldn't read one word to you. But if he flipped over in his Bible, Tom could read it word for word. And of course, he stumbled a few times as he read it. But Tom was able to read I've told that story to some people and they, they come away and say, you know what, that's an amazing memorization of Scripture. <laughs> that man must have had like a memory bank that the world's never known. But I don't believe it was just an amazing memory of Scripture. I believe Tom stepped out in faith and God provided God said, you answer my calling to preach, Tom, I'll take care of that. And Tom said, you know what, God, if you're going to take care of it, I believe it, I'll step out. Tom says, I've been called to be a preacher. Tom steps out in faith, God provides, he reads the Bible. Will you step out as well? And believe me, I know this morning that you're going to have all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't like Tom who couldn't read the Bible and was called to preach, and like Abraham who had one son and he had a promise that through this son he's going to have recipients, like, like he's going to have descendants uh, as numerous as the stars in the sky. We all have a reason why we shouldn't go through with this step of faith, an excuse why, you know what, that probably isn't the best idea. But I believe that like Tom and like Abraham, if we step out in faith, God will provide. He'll provide in His way and in His timing, but one way or another, God will provide when we step out in faith. But here's the thing. You'll never know it to be true if you don't take that step yourself. So whatever it is God is asking you to do for Him today, whatever step God is asking you to take, go ahead and throw your excuses out the window. Take that step of faith today and watch and be amazed as you see how God will provide for you.